When you walk into test day, you want to make sure that you have all of your ACT math formulas ready to go. Unlike the SAT, the ACT does not offer any math formulas. So you want to make sure that you have them in your head already so that you don't have to stop and think about them as you go through the questions. For average and average speed, oftentimes students aren't quite sure what the difference is. And we can demonstrate that best if we're talking about a trip that you take. Let's say you start off at 40 miles per hour and you travel for two hours. You decide that you want to speed up a little bit or perhaps you change your route and you can go a little bit faster. So you start going 50 miles per hour. And even with that though, it takes another three hours for you to get to your destination. So if you're just taking the average of two things, then you take 40 and 50, add them, divide by two. You take the sum of the terms, which would be 90, divide it by the number of terms, which is two, you get 45. That's not how it works with average speed. Average speed is total distance over total time. The total time is five hours, so that's pretty straightforward, but the total distance has to actually be calculated. So you take 40 miles per hour, at, and you're going 40 miles per hour, and you're traveling for two hours, and you get 80 miles. You then speed up, but you travel for another three hours, and you get 150 miles. When you add those two together, you get 230 divided by 5 is 46, not 45. 45 will be a trap answer, of course, if this were on the test. You're not going to see this exact same question on the test, but you are going to see something similar if they include average speed. Then the average speed questions, though, can help you out if you're thinking about them with common sense, because if you're going faster for longer, then your average speed is going to be higher than just a straightforward average. So it makes sense that you're going 46 miles per hour as an average speed. If the numbers were reversed, then you would be going, your average speed would be 44. So it's just like if you had Usain Bolt on your relay team, your overall average speed is going to be significantly faster because you have someone who's super, super fast. When you take a look at mode and median, these are similar to the ideas of average and average speed in that you want to know what the difference is and you want to know how to spot them. So if you have a list of numbers for mode, just look for the one that appears the most often. And then for median, you're actually looking for the middle value. For probability, this one comes up in the case of independent events. So let's say that the chance it's going to rain tomorrow is 10% or 1 tenth. The chance it's going to rain the day after tomorrow is also 10% or 1 tenth. Multiply them together, and the chance it's going to rain on both days is only 1%, which is good if you're planning a picnic. Do not add or subtract probabilities if they are independent events. You want to make sure you multiply them. Now, for percents, the idea is if you have a whole value, and if you can pick, you always want to pick 100. So if you have 100 cupcakes and you eat 4% of those cupcakes, you're going to wind up eating 4 cupcakes. So 4% would be 4 over 100 times 100 is going to give you 4. So it's the idea of manipulating different numbers in terms of whole and part and enjoying cupcakes. For intersecting lines and parallel lines, you want to know a few things. If you have one value, so let's say this is 130 degrees, you can find everything else. And they're labeled really well. So all the A's are 130 degrees, and then all of the B's would have to be 50 degrees because they're supplementary angles, which means they add up to 50. Not 50, silly me, they add up to 180 degrees. So this is the same idea as well. And actually, I'll keep with the color scheme of 50 as blue and on 130 is green. And then those add up to 360 because it actually creates a circle. For the distance formula, these are actually distance, midpoint, and slope all have to do with the coordinate plane. And you're going to need, let's say you have two, three, and four, seven. You're going to need two points. With those two points, you can actually calculate all of that. You can calculate the distance of those between those two points. You can cal 
calculate the midpoint of those two points, and you could calculate the slope of that line if those points are on a line. For midpoint, one of the things that you can think about is that it's the average of two points. It's the average of the x values of the two points and the average of the y values of the two points. For triangle, every single triangle that you see, you can calculate the area if you have the base and the heights. If you're looking at side measures, if you have a right triangle, then you can calculate the hypotenuse if you have the leg measures. If you have a special right triangle, you actually don't need two values. So for the Pythagorean theorem, you're going to need two out of the three values to use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the third side. For special right triangles, if you can establish that it's a special right triangle, if they give you the angle measures, then all they would have to give you, for example here, if they tell you that the hypotenuse is 10, then you know every other side. You only need one side measure when it comes to special right triangles. And it has to do with a ratio. So if they tell you that the hypotenuse of a 30, 60, 90 right triangle is 10, then you know the other two sides. When it comes to 45, 45, 90, it's the same idea. And you want to keep in mind, too, that a 45, 45, 90 right triangle is a square cut along the diagonal. So if they tell you that the side of a square is 6 and that it was cut along the diagonal, you know for sure that the diagonal is 6 root 2. Because a square has equal sides. It has four equal sides. So when you cut it along the diagonal, you wind up with two separate triangles, and they have equal legs and a hypotenuse. And it has to be a right triangle because squares inside of them have four 90-degree angles. That's a really neat thing to look out for. For circles, you will find that knowing what the radius measure is is a really good place to start when you're working with circles. So if you're not sure where to start on a circle question, check to see if you have the value of the radius, because from there you can find the area and the circumference. Make sure you know the difference between the two. The circumference is also considered the perimeter. The area is the space. So if you were looking at this, this would be the face of a coaster, would be the area, and the circumference would be the edge of the coaster. When it comes to the length of arc and area of a sector, this is a lot easier to understand if you have an example. So let's say that N is 90 degrees. That means that that segment, whether you're looking at the arc or the sector, is one-fourth of the entire circle. And that's because 90 over 360 is one-fourth. From there, let's say R is, let's say it's four. From there, you could actually figure out what the arc length is and what the area of the sector is based on the fact that you can solve for the area of the entire circle and then divide it by 4. And you can solve for the circumference and divide it by 4. For the equation of a circle, this actually is if you're graphing it in a coordinate plane. So what you'll find is your graphing calculator will be super helpful with that. And you'll see one question at most with this type of equation of a circle. And if you do happen to see it, it's going to be in the last 10 questions. These are the higher difficulty. For plane geometry, in addition to triangles and circles, don't count out the fact that they might also have rectangles, parallelograms, and trapezoids. Rectangles are pretty straightforward. Just make sure they're asking for the area and not the perimeter. You don't want to get those two mixed up. For parallelograms, you want to be on the lookout because oftentimes they give you the measure of the length and the height, which you need for the area, but they also throw in the width. And they're not trying to confuse you. They do want you to recognize that, so let's say the length is 8, the width is 10, and the height is 6. And I, disclaimer, not drawn to scale. A lot of students will fall for a trap answer of 80 because they take the width and the length just like they would with a rectangle, but you're not going to do that on test day. Instead, you're going to pick the correct answer, which is 48, because you take the length and the height. For the trapezoid, this one's not too bad. Take a look. So let's say that this is 10 and this is 20, and you have a height of 5. 
your area is going to be 75. You take the average of the two bases, which would be 15, and you multiply it by the height. It's really not so bad. It looks challenging and it's kind of a strange shape but it's not nearly as bad as you think. If you wanted to, you could split it up into two triangles and a rectangle. If you feel more comfortable doing that and you have enough information, that's fine. It's also really easy to just memorize the formula and use it to your advantage. Our last two ideas are 3D images. When you're talking about volume, you wanna multiply length, width, and height. If it's a rectangular solid, if it's a right cylinder, make sure you take pi r squared, which is the area, times the height. One other thing you might see is surface area of a rectangular solid. And that's going to be, and you can hear me typing, you'll be able to see it in just a moment. That's going to give you surface area. So you take 2 times LW plus 2 times WH plus two times LH, and that looks like the number one. Because on test day, you're gonna feel like the number one student in the class. No, it's really an L. It just really looks like the number one. So we have surface area, we have volume, and then if they ask you for surface area of the right cylinder, they'll provide that formula on the test because it's not considered to be a common formula. So if they throw anything at you that includes a formula, use it to your advantage because they're providing you with something that they didn't expect you to memorize. So look through this list, think about what you do already know and what you're going to want to memorize for test day to help increase your score and reduce your stress.